Tonight on The Henry Rollins Show, we are joined by one of today's smartest comedians, Eddie Izzard. He's here to talk about his newest endeavors on stage and screen. Def Cab for Cuties with Heidi May for an acoustic musical performance. And I'll give you a few things to consider before you check out The Da Vinci Code. Keep it here, folks. It's going to be a great show. A new Zogby International poll shows that 69% of Americans support public school teachers presenting the theory of evolution as well as theories that are in opposition. If only there were any that didn't have God somewhere in them. The theory of evolution proposed by Charles Darwin in his groundbreaking work, Origin of Species, published in 1859, has been championed by scientists ever since. And like evolution itself, the science of it, the gathering evidence and data is a ceaseless pursuit of scientists all over the world. In the theory of evolution, there is no talk of God and no Bibles are used. They're not looking for higher powers, extraterrestrials, or anything else that could be found in the science fiction section because they are not dealing with fiction. As more is known and more is shown, Christian fundamentalists see their fingers being pulled off the steering wheel as their oppressive shackles are more and more being seen as fear-based nonsense. And so these awful people who favor abstinence-only sex education, as does the President of the United States, seek yet again to put God into public school classrooms. First, it was the rewrite of the Pledge of Allegiance, the addition of under God between one nation and indivisible, which they insist sounds great. Actually, it sounds like a badly punched in edit that throws the rhythm of the piece way off and totally removes the power of the statement. Well, they're back with a the theory of intelligent design. It's not much of a theory. It's more of an over-fancified collection of sentiments basically saying that there are life forms and functions in them that are so complex only God Almighty could have come up with them and we can just stop wondering and just start praising him. Now, the foundation of intelligent design relies heavily upon an idea called irreducible complexity. The breathtaking stupidity of irreducible complexity is only outweighed by the complete lack of science involved. It is just intellectually lazy and cannot be tested or challenged. You can't get God to come down to the lab and prove a fucking thing. You just have to believe. And science does not operate on faith. Faith is taught in churches. If you can't prove it in the scientific world, you've got no game. These Christian fundamentalist psychotics are so power mad, they will stop at nothing. Willful ignorance, intimidation, and suppression of information are their tools. Intelligent design, abstinence-only sex ed, the new dark ages are upon us. Hang on, folks, this century is gonna be a rough ride. Joining me now is Eddie Izzard, whose surreal monologues have established him as one of the funniest, most intelligent, and outspoken stand-up comedians of our time. After turning his attention to acting with roles in films like Ocean's 12 and The Cat's Meow, he has quickly become a sought-after screen presence. Eddie, thanks for being on the show, man. It's quite all right. It's good to see you again. Good to see you again. Eddie, you are doing a lot of work in films these days. You've got one coming out, My S Super Ex-Girlfriend, yeah. Across the Universe. Yeah. So a lot of people know you for, for the stand-up stuff. Mm. Uh, like the first time I saw you was uh, like sh the Shaftesbury Theater run in England years oh, really? ago and all of that. Oh. And so that's how I know you. And then all of a sudden I'm seeing you in movies all over the place. So did anything you were doing on stage all those years affect or influence anything you're doing on screen now? Is it a help or? Um, it's, there is something in there. I mean, the only thing that my training should do, having done stand-up and all this weird comedy beforehand, is that if I can really 
struggle to get into a role, learn, develop whatever te te technique I can to, to, to act a role as well as I can, then it should be somewhat different to what everyone else has done because uh, I've just come such a weird route. Right. Uh, that is hopefully my thing. I mean, sometimes you can do a comedian becomes an actor and they just don't deliver because the bottom line of comedy is to be funny and the bottom line of acting is to be truthful and they get that mixed up sometimes or don't even notice that that's the thing. But I have tried to be completely honorable and completely get it completely inside characters or as much as I can and, uh, and I, just, I just hope that I can bring something different to, to uh, what I'm doing yeah. uh, that stands out and then people go, well, what the hell is this? This is a bit weird. The comedy, was it a road to screen? Were you always thinking, I'll do this and then maybe someone will notice me? It was, it was more like uh, the actual route was at 10, I wanted to be uh, in films and I thought, great. And I was reading all this, cr I just read credits and I thought, oh, these, these are places, people do these, these have names, they right. all exist. And I, I started learning about all of that. And then I was at school and I didn't know you could be an actor when you're, when you're a kid, so I just went to school. And then I wasn't getting any roles at school, so the, the, this thing of being a film actor was just miles away. Mm -hmm. And then I... I, I was in a class thing, uh, uh, comedy thing, and I got some laughs doing this. And I thought, well, I like comedy, and I seem to get some laughs here. And then I discovered Monty Python. I thought, well, I can, they write and do their own stuff, and they're in it. Yeah. So I'll get a role this way by writing my own stuff and putting myself in it. And then I just became a convert to comedy and thought, right, that's it, comedy. Stuff drama, I'm doing comedy. So I was on the comedy thing, and then I was going to be in a sketch thing. As soon as I got to university, I dumped university. I was going to be in a sketch program on television. And, and then that didn't work, so I thought I'd do street performing because that would teach me something. And then that was very difficult. And then I learned how to do stuff on the street. And then I realized I had to be a stand up because it became the new buzzy thing in Britain. And so I got into stand up. And then that started taking off. And because it had taken so long, and I was so keen to get things going when I was 18, and now I was 900 years old, and I just thought, right, well, if this is going to take this long, I'm going to do both. So I'm going to do comedy, and I'm going to, but I'm going to hold it back, not do television. Never done a television show on on, on uh, telly. Um, I've done, you know, put my specials on, but that's it. Right. And, and I thought I'll get dramatic roles at the same time, and I'll, and I'll start pushing both up. And so it was, I became greedy because it just taken so long. Because right. it wasn't a plan. I was just going to be Mr. Comedy, and then I thought, well, if it's going to take this long, I'm going to be Mr. Both, right. and confuse people. I have a schizophrenic career. And uh, I'm sure some people look at the comedy and they don't even see the linkage or they, they just think, oh, hopefully they go, oh, is, it, is that the same person? Right. Well, the comedy, I, I just wonder at some point if you were ever surprised at how well it did, not doubting your talent, but you're, you're so huge in England. I mean, the, these like weeks long engagements at these theaters, I mean, it, it's, it's fantastic. And, and the, the specials are all great. I have them all at home, watched them many times over. The, it, did it ever become like a whoa, not this much? No, unfortunately not. I mean, I guess it would be <laughs> kind of hard to ego the size it, of a planet, and because uh, I was so hell, because I was wanting to do it when I was younger. I was actually, I just keep pushing it up. I mean, in the end, I was playing Wembley Arena last time, and these ten thousand seaters, and and then some people going, this is too big. But I, I'm sure it's like when the Beatles played Shea Stadium, they go, oh, we can't hear anything. This is not a good yeah. gig, but. I've, I've pushed to play bigger and bigger gigs, just to, and also small gigs. So 100 seaters and 10,000 seaters. I like playing yeah. both of them. And, but I don't know, unfortunately, which is a sad reflection on ridiculous ego, it has never got to a place where I thought, whoa. But it has got to a nice place where it's gone, oh, you know, because it is nice to work with people. And like in Ocean's 12, I didn't uh, do anything. I had a couple of scenes, there's nothing much to do, but it was very nice to be in a big, crazy mm. film. and. Um, and just do that and hang out with those guys. Well, let's let, let's talk about the comedy for a second. I know in Europe and in, in Britain, you know, you do huge there, and British humor is often more subtle in a way. It's you know, thanks to guys like John Cleese, it often comes with a, a very heavy intellectual impact. So my question is, uh, not assuming anything, have you found a difference? in American audiences when compared to European or English audiences? I don't think so. I mean, this links back to what I was saying About before. the cultish, the people who are really into it show up. Yeah, well, there's, there's that, but also the smart people, um, uh, the smart people around the world are all smart. They, 
in, in I think around the world, people see a, 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 an image of America as being middle America as being not necessarily as sharp. Yeah. This is because of maybe because of an aggressive foreign policy that says we're going to go and do this thing, which tends not to be a fine thinking thing, but a big sort of this is how we're approaching it and, it, and, it, and it's and it's quite flat on. Yeah. And so people think that everyone, all 300 million Americans, are all thinking in that way. And I think part of my job is to explain to people in Europe that you no, know, there's very sharp, very. Uh, uh, intelligent Americans on all political spectrums, I should say, and there's and the stupid people in America and the stupid people in Europe. You know, so I, I think the levels are all the same, and uh, and all over America, they they all seem pretty sharp. My my shows are kind of self policing in the fact that if people are not going to deal with you, I'm not, I'm not saying anything terribly tricky. It's just I'm I'm throwing images together kind of in a kind of a weird way, and if people don't like it, they'll probably go away and say to other people who wouldn't like that kind of thing, you better not go. Mm. But um, but the, I, I don't find a huge difference in, in the audiences around, uh, around the world, which I think is great. And I think television is that thing where all, all, the, all the kind of aware people are watching similar kinds of things on television, History Channel, Documentaries, uh, Discovery Channel. You can get all this information in. I'm someone who likes television because I've learned from it. I've taught myself from it. I watch programs on things and then I, then I learn from them because I assume they're probably telling just about the truth. You can tell with your, your bullshit detector. Um, saying all that, um, is there anything that's going on culturally now in America anywhere that you think is really funny? Something that you would maybe take on the stage? I've been talking a lot about reality shows lately. Like there's nothing new about them. But the fact that they have kind of supplanted drama and is this kind of the new well, you know, what's next? Throwing people to lions? That might be next season. No, I, that, well, that is interesting because I was wondering that. If they did something where they said, look, if you join, you could die. But if you win, you win a bazillion yeah, yeah. dollars. I think people would go oh, for it. They'd line right they'd up. Line it up. <laughs> if you got the gladiatorial thing right back, it would be that. Because I've, I've often wondered, you know, ever since Gladiator, the film happened and came back in, and, we, and so there were a lot more documentaries on it. I wonder what it was like when you were going there. And apparently women were crazy about it, you know, because these gladiators who were slaves and couldn't get out, but they were, so they were forbidden, or not forbidden, but impossible to get to heroes of sexuality because they were killing some other guy. And, and how people would react to it these days, and I don't think there'd be much difference. You got, you got that on telly, people would be, would still react exactly the same way. They'd be, they'd be rock and roll gods and they'd be, yeah. um, and they'd be killing people and would be, hey. If we just, we're just, we're so close to that. It, it is, it is weird. Um, but I don't know, yes, the reality things do, I mean, I dislike them. I, I kind of officially dislike them in my brain. And then when they come on, I tend to go, I tend to get sucked in. If I watch it for, there's, I don't know, there's something like two, if you watch it for a longer period than a certain period, if you get to know these people, then you go, oh, what are these? And you keep it on in case they say something, which is really odd. It's, it's like paint drying. It's like just hanging around your friends. It's gossip. It, you know, it's a gossip TV. It's, it's weird. And, and I, I don't think it's going to... I was wondering, is, is it going to go away? Is it a fad that's, that's coming now and it's going to go away? And I don't think it is. I, I think it's too cheap to make. I think it's now around for the foreseeable future. Okay, so that being said, where do you think that takes us culturally? Does it dead end? Or does it turn into lethal injection live at eight? Like what finally, where everyone just saturates? I think we will, we will continue to go down to plumb the depths of human depravity in, in television viewing. At the same time, continuing to go up and try and find the heights of, of serenity and of, and of wisdom. I think we're doing them at the same time. I think things might be getting better and worse at the same time because both are very watchable. One is wisdom and one is depravity and and we might be trying to go for those edges because those are the water cooler things you see that guy shoot that guy yeah then you see that thing where it was life affirming about that birth and death and marriage and you know so those are the things which are going to affect us i don't know quite where that takes us all but i do i do i do i am positive about human beings i do think overall we beat the nazis it's gotta it's gotta be generally like that no, that's great I appreciate your mind. I'm so glad you were a guest on my show. Thanks, Thanks for, for hanging me. out with me, Eddie. Thank you very much, man. Appreciate it. Coming up a bit later in the show, an exclusive musical performance from Death Cab for Cutie. But first, another installment of Drawing Conclusions.
I've been checking out how I am being marketed to on the internet. You know, I have my little mailbox and I get incoming mail. And for like six to eight months once, a while ago, I got inundated with porn uh, you know, offers. This is see the hottest sluts on the internet. 18 years and four seconds old. Sick little sluts. And they want your burning hate paste all over their right young tits. You sick. Fuck, you want to see them pee-pee on each other? Click here! You know, if, you, if you're dumb enough or lonely enough, like, okay. <laughs> Welcome to Porn World! And you'll see these huge legs on your screen opening. Oh, labia pulling back like fleshy curtains. Oh, a clitoris clanging like a sea bell. Ding, 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 ding. And way at the back of this dark, deep vaginal tunnel, you see... You know, glimmering, blinking. Click here to enter. Click here to enter. You're like. <sighs> <laughs> Welcome to the Clit Kingdom. All cameras, all, all dirty, peepy, Amsterdam, naughty, disgusting shit girl cam updated every four seconds. You sick fuck. All we need is your visa card number and you'll have so much pussy you won't know what to do. do you, uh, don't you want that? I know I really don't. And so you double click to get away. Boom, you're hyperlinked to another website. It's Ass Kingdom. Oh God, leave me alone. More of girls' anuses than you've ever seen. You're all like, God damn, let me go, let me go. You double click to get away, to get away, to get away. You keep getting hyperlinked to more and more and more. Pussy, you finally run from your chair, run to the wall, rip the phone cord out of the wall so you can get to some moral solid ground. So I'm told. <laughs> I've never done it. <laughs> the city council of a town near Los Angeles recently banned all smoking in public places. Calabasas citizens can smoke in their car or their house, but not in the local park. This is like stopping nurturing mothers from breastfeeding their babies in restaurants. Smokers need easy access to tobacco smoking teeth as much as a newborn who's mewling for its life-giving mother's milk. The anti-tobacco lobby has won the main battle, stopping smoking in restaurants, movie theaters, and hospital burn units. So why do they keep pushing? Hitler overreached when he crossed into Russia, and look what happened to him. I think the biggest problem is that nobody's looking at the positive side of cigarettes anymore, the filtered side. With yellowed teeth, browned fingers, and a phlegmy throat, you're letting the world know that you're just not another health-conscious yuppie. You're a devil-may-care nihilist, ready to throw yourself on the mercy of tax-funded health care at the first hacking signs of emphysema. Smoking stale musky aroma is like an ancient Native American perfume of drying tobacco and beaver pelts. Besides pissing in public, what other activity lets you mark your territory as easily as lingering secondhand smoke? Cigarettes are a social lubricant. Without them, you'd never be able to share a pack and strike up a conversation with your local cat hoarders, glue sniffers, and trash pickers. Smoking also fights unwanted pregnancy as it can lead to impotence in men and unattractive skin problems for women. But most of all, by smoking, you're letting the world know that you're not the kind of person who's susceptible to stupid advertising campaigns and celebrity spokespeople telling you not to smoke. You're only susceptible to those ads from the friendly cartoon smile of Joe Camel. And now, here's Heidi Mae with this week's musical performance from Death Cab for Cutie. Thanks, Henry. Honest and emotional songwriting has made this band an indie favorite through four celebrated albums. With their fifth album plans, they enter new territory on an international scale, but they never stray from the infectious sound that already had millions listening. Here to perform a special acoustic version of Crooked Teeth, we welcome Ben Gibbard and Chris Walla of Death Cab for Cutie, Uncut. <clears throat> Sat beneath a willow tree Whose tears didn't count They just hung in the air And refused to fall, to fall I knew I made a horrible call And now the state line felt like the Berlin Wall And there was no doubt about what 
side I was on Thank you again to my guests, Death Cab for Cutie and Eddie Izzard. Before we go, I need to point out that as the movie version of The Da Vinci Code makes a few bucks undermining the belief in a virginal Jesus, our end credits should go to Muhammad al-Saman and Tom Cruise. In 1945, al-Saman was on an Egyptian desert fertilizer search when he discovered the 1,600-year-old Nag Hammadi Library, a bunch of unknown gospels showing that, hey, maybe there's more to Jesus' life than we've been told. In 2005, finished with his California desert search for a willing concubine, Tom Cruise went on a love-fueled publicity rampage, revealing that his heretofore mysterious Church of Scientology was nothing more than a faith with a chip on its shoulder against depressed mothers and the concept of free will. So before you convince yourself that Tom Hanks' character has revealed the dark secret of Christianity, take a moment to thank some truly illuminating people. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.